Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute. Welcome to episode 255 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Who gets to be a citizen of the United States? How does the United States define who belongs to the nation? These questions may sound like I borrowed a few headlines from today's news outlets because they're questions we regularly ask ourselves. There are also questions that early Americans asked themselves in the earliest days of the early republic. In the early United States, the question of who belongs and who could belong to the new nation was a fraught question, especially in a nation practicing racialized slavery. But the question of citizenship, who belongs and who could belong to the early United States, is a really important question. So we're bringing in an expert to help us investigate how early Americans viewed citizenship. Our expert is Martha S. Jones a professor of history at Johns Hopkins University and a former public interest litigator. Martha's most recent book, Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America, investigates how early Americans thought about citizenship and the ways in which free African-Americans asserted and fought for their inclusion as full citizens of the United States. Now, as we explore early American ideas about citizenship, Martha reveals the notion of birthright citizenship and how it entered early American thinking about citizenship what the United States Constitution has to say about citizenship, and details about how early Americans thought about national belonging and the ways in which early African Americans pressed their case that free blacks should have full citizenship rights in the United States. But first, this episode came about and was informed by your questions about early American history. You reached out with questions about citizenship, and one of the places you reached out to me was through the Ben Franklin's World Listener community on Facebook. The Ben Franklin's World listener community is filled with people like you, people who love history and who want to know more about the early American past. And it's in this group where we can chat about how history informs some of the big questions we ask today, like the question of who belongs and who can belong to the United States. You should join the listener community and join the discussion. It's a private Facebook group, and it's really easy to join. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com and click on the Join the Community button right on the homepage. It's right there on the top of the sidebar, so you can't miss it. All right, are you ready to explore how early Americans thought about citizenship? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. Our guest is the Society of Black Alumni presidential professor and a professor of history at Johns Hopkins University. She's a legal and cultural historian who investigates how black Americans have shaped the story of American democracy. Now, prior to her academic career, she worked as a public interest litigator in New York City. And now she's the author of three books, including Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Martha S. Jones. Thanks for having me. So in Birthright Citizens, Martha takes up Black Americans' point of view to tell the history of race and rights in the pre-Civil War United States. Martha, I know we're about to embark on a fascinating and possibly far-ranging conversation, so could we begin our discussion with the idea of birthright citizenship? Would you tell us about birthright citizenship as a historical and legal concept? To begin the story, I think we'd have to go back to the 17th century. That would be one starting place to English common law. And a question that is certainly in the air and before lawmakers in 17th century England, but one that persists until our time, which is how does a state, how does a nation, how does an empire determine membership? Who is in, who is out, who is subject to the obligations of belonging? who is entitled to the privileges of belonging. So one starting place for telling that story in the United States is to go back to 17th century England, to the English common law, and those cases in that setting in which we learn how it is that one is English comes to be determined by birth, by the place of one's birth at birth, 
that is what determines who is a subject of the king of England in the 17th century. And this idea of birthright, subjecthood, and then birthright citizenship is one that carries over into North America and into the early United States. That sounds like a really interesting way to define citizenship, that you belong to this kingdom or you belong to that country simply because you were born within its borders. So was this idea of birthright citizenship or birthright subjecthood unique to England or was it invented by someone else? Some people would argue that this is a question that takes us back to the ancient world where we get two broad stroke approaches or ways of thinking about membership or belonging. The first is use soli or the right of the soil, what we come to call birthright citizenship. And the companion to that is use sanguinis. So this is the right of the blood. Today, we would think of that as citizenship or belonging as determined by one's parentage. So these are two ancient ways of thinking about belonging to a nation, to a state, to a polity. And we recognize that until today, those two streams are still flowing through the way we think about belonging. And how did early Americans think about belonging and citizenship? How did they define their ability to belong to the British Empire and later who would have membership rights in the early United States? I'm a legal historian in part, and one way we approach this question is by way of texts. We look at statutes, we look at constitutions, we look at edicts that come out of parliament. And part of what we discover in early America is predominantly a sort of silence, or we might say a set of unspoken assumptions about belonging. So the puzzle for us as we approach this question is how do we explain a silence? And so we partly do that through practice to looking at the ways in which in the everyday life of members of the early United States or in colonial America, the ways in which belonging is practiced. But the real key, if you will, to understanding this story is that citizenship is not long thought about. It is not deeply considered. It evolves out of a set of assumptions about who belongs rather than out of any particular text that directs or determines or regulates who belongs. What are some of those assumptions that early Americans may have had about citizenship and who could belong? Key to the story that I tell in Birthright Citizens and one that I think listeners will anticipate, one key is the question of race or racial identity or the role that racism plays in thinking about who belongs in the colonial era and certainly in the revolutionary era. Should color be a bar to belonging is a live question on the ground, and it is one that lawmakers approach in a rather inconsistent way. If I could point to an example that is, I hope, familiar to many listeners, it is the Constitution of 1787 which does only speak of citizens in glancing terms, does not define who is a citizen and who is not a citizen, and also does not draw an express color line with respect to national belonging, even as the Constitution of 1787 draws distinctions between free people, enslaved people, and Indians. It does not draw an express color line when it comes to national belonging. I know we're curious about what the Constitution has to say or not say in this case on citizenship, but before we dig into the Constitution, you mentioned that as a legal scholar, one of the things you do is you look at texts, statutes, edicts, and other elements of the legal system to explore the past. Would you tell us more about how you, as a historian, research ideas about citizenship? I begin with these formal texts, probably the things that we most associate with the history of law, judicial opinions, constitutions, acts of legislatures, learned treatises that are sort of synthetic texts on the law. We begin there, but we don't end there. And that's, I think, an important insight for people who are thinking about how to understand the history of law. We move from those texts to 
political conventions. We move to newspaper commentary. We even look to the informal writing of lawyers and judges and other lawmakers, really looking for opportunities to hear these figures in somewhat less formal and oftentimes more expansive terms than talk again about, in my case, the question of citizenship and birthright. And we're still not done because, as I think your listeners will know, African-Americans, former slaves in early America, are to a significant degree excluded from the kinds of halls of officialdom that are producing texts. They are even on the margins of the political culture that is debating many of these questions. So how do we then capture the ideas? How do we capture the ways in which African-Americans are also weighing in on this debate? So here now I'm turning to the African-American and the anti-slavery press. I am turning to the private writings of African-Americans to the degree that they've survived. And I am looking at I guess the way to put it is I'm looking at what people do to understand what they think. And so here, finally, I am digging into the records of a local courthouse, in my example, the city of Baltimore in Maryland, and I am using the notations of clerks and scribes and judges to some degree in lower courts to discover how it is that former slaves are, we might say, inhabiting or performing or in an everyday sense, claiming themselves to be citizens and rights-bearing people in the new United States. I'm curious about comparing some of the records you looked at, because as you said, there are the records of the courthouse, which to me are quite matter-of-fact in how they convey information. And then You also looked at very different types of records when you looked at the personal writings of African-Americans. So would you tell us a bit more about the contrast between all these different record types you looked at and the different types of information they revealed to you? You're very right about the court records. They are ministerial. They are shorthand. They are not intended to tell the kind of full-throated stories that we'd like to tell about what happens there. But they do allow us to begin to glimpse people. So once I'm able to discover characters in the courthouse, I then turn, for example, to the African-American press, now looking for those same figures, those same scenes to see if people will tell me more by way of the newspaper about the meaning of what it is that they are engaged in in the courthouse. I am looking at the records of what we come to call the colored convention movement. This is a parallel political culture developed by former slaves as they are excluded from political parties, as they are excluded from legislatures. We have the emergence of a Black-led convention movement where I find figures like those in the local courthouse now standing at a podium and giving us full-throated speeches. So this requires, as a methodological matter, making a set of well-considered associations between what people do in one context and what they say. And then my other technique is to follow individuals across time and to look at the way in which what they do, if you will, evolves as circumstances change. So that means, for example, following people through the long history of slavery and the early republic all the way to the post-Civil War era when possible, because under new political, social, legal circumstances, after the Civil War, people who I've known for many, many, many decades are doing new things that are related to what they used to do in the local courthouse, but now have a much more express political valence to them. So this technique, which involves a kind of, in part, a collective biography, insists on following, when we can, people over time 
rather than simply presenting them as snapshots, hoping that with that longer view of lives and life histories, we can understand better the intents and the purposes and the big picture frame, the big picture thinking that people have with them when they come into a local courthouse. That's really fascinating because I know one of the questions I get a lot is, is how do historians get into the records? How do they know where to look for more information? And it sounds like you start in the courthouse, find a few interesting characters, and then look for more information about those people in other archives where I'm likely to do the opposite, which is I start in the archives, find a few interesting characters, and then track those characters down to the courthouse. Now, one historical record I'd like us to get back to is one you mentioned earlier, and that's the Constitution of 1787. You noted that the Constitution doesn't really say anything specific or concrete about citizenship. Do we know why that is? Do we know why the framers decided to leave out citizenship from the Constitution? So I was afraid you were going to ask me this, but I know you know that the hardest thing for a historian to explain sometimes is silence. Why is something not there as opposed to why is it there? So I can say a little bit about what we come to assume about this silence in the Constitution. And the first is that there is an expectation that the principle of use soli that comes out of English common law will carry over into the new United States. So that is the first assumption that I think is operating underneath the Constitution. The second is that the framers do not anticipate wholly the way in which national belonging will become a highly contested question and assume that citizenship is apparent. Citizenship is evident, of course, because it is for white Americans, those that we call white Americans, for European Americans, their citizenship status is assumed and is not articulated in the Constitution. But I would say, and this is me really putting a thought out there. The framers we know are reluctant, for example, to include terms like slave or slavery in the Constitution because the sorts of terms they fear will undermine or delegitimize the Constitution, perhaps not for the purposes of its ratification in the new United States, but in the eyes of the world. And so at least we might wonder about the degree to which had the Constitution been more forthcoming about the framers thinking about the role of race and racism with respect to national belonging, whether that too was something to be avoided in the interest of the legitimacy of the text overall. What we do know, of course, is that The framers know that there is such a concept as citizenship. The Constitution rests on the idea of citizenship to an important degree, right? Federal office holders, the president must be a natural born citizen. A U.S. senator must have been a citizen for a minimum of nine years. These are signs that the framers are aware that there are citizens and non citizens to be anticipated in the new United States, and that citizenship matters for the purposes of office holding, but for governance more generally. And the people I write about, former slaves, are a little bit like we are, reading this text carefully. And when they happen on this language that requires the president to be a natural-born citizen, they extrapolate from that. I think quite reasonably to say, well, if the president is a natural born citizen, there must be such a category of persons. And why aren't we also natural born citizens? There is no color line in this provision that defines the qualifications for the presidency. You know, those are really interesting points, and they complement what we've heard other scholars tell us about the Constitution, which is that. The framers simply couldn't have foreseen everything, that the Constitution was meant to solve a specific set of problems in a specific time. And it sounds like maybe in their time, citizenship was an assumption that many people made and knew about, and it just 
wasn't the big issue or problem in the late 18th century as we might think about it today. I think that's right. And it will take a crisis. It will take a real dilemma on the ground, if you will, to draw the nation's attention to the silences in the Constitution and the lapses in the Constitution with respect to belonging. This turns out to be a key to the story of citizenship and its evolution over time in the United States that rarely do we come to this question of citizenship as an academic question or as a question of political theory alone. We come to the question of citizenship in the early United States because former slaves present a dilemma on the ground, and now the nation has to put its minds together to resolve that puzzle. And this is the way citizenship develops as a concept and as a practice in the U.S., rather than through removed or abstracted or armchair debates about the subject. So the Constitution doesn't really talk about or define citizenship. What exactly did this omission in the Constitution mean for early Americans on the ground? Because it kind of sounds like they would like a definition of who can and can't be a citizen. And yet you noted that there needed to be a crisis to bring this question to a head. So did early Americans brew a crisis to bring the question of citizenship up or was a crisis brewing over something else? And the question just kind of came up as a result. Well, I think we could say the crisis is brewing in the context of the revolution itself, which is to say, on the one hand, the revolutionary generation is immersed in a set of ideas, a set of ideas about natural rights, about universal rights that are now going to have to be part of any debate about citizenship. So that's one way in which the question is brewing even during the revolution. And at the same time, African Americans are a part of not just the revolutionary era, but the revolution itself. African American men who serve in the military emerge from that experience with a very pointed question about their status before the new nation, before the law, ultimately before the Constitution. So that question is brewing and will come to a boil, if you will, in the early republic. And how did this question of who is and who is not a citizen manifest in specific states? Because we always like to go to the Constitution first when we study American law, but each state had its own constitution. And most states in the early republic drafted their constitutions well before the Constitution of 1787. So is it possible that individual states did more than the federal government to define what citizenship meant? Yes. And I think while today we would approach that question as a very structured and linear one where we would hold U.S. citizenship and the citizenship in an individual state apart and easily recognize the way in which the Constitution has come to be understood as apportioning some authority to the federal government and other authority to the individual states, it isn't quite that clear in the earliest years of the United States. This is still an equation that is coming into being, that is being worked out. And as a consequence, for example, in the state I study of Maryland, when Maryland drafts its first state constitution, which it does in 1776, for example, Maryland defines the qualification for voting, which is the purview, the exclusive purview of the state as requiring that voters be U.S. citizens. So I use that example to say these are two intertwined concepts that are being wrestled with by the individual states. What does it mean for a state to say in order to exercise the right to vote, which is a state derived right, one must also be a citizen of the United States? These two things are interlinked in the earliest years of the new United States, and it leads to a lot of murky thinking about what the relationship between these two forms of citizenship or these two sites of citizenship should be. 
I'm curious about how all this murky thinking played out for free African-Americans, because one of the things I really loved about your book, Martha, is that Birthright Citizens really seeks to talk about the everyday experiences of everyday free black people. So how did all this murky thinking about citizenship impact the lives of free African-Americans? Yes. So murkiness is my theme. So thank you for that. (laughs) And I'll give you an example. One of the things we know about the early United States is that African-American men are highly represented. That is, they appear in great numbers around people who are working as mariners, as seamen, as sailors. And these are individuals who have many questions, including questions about where they stand before the law, where they stand before the nation and the Constitution. And the answer comes in two forms. On the one hand, from the earliest years of the United States, seamen, including black seamen, are issued by federal customs officials what are called seamen's protection certificates. These are federally issued documents that testify to the citizenship status of the holder, and they are intended to function as a shield against impressment at sea or in foreign ports, particularly against the British. So black sailors go to sea and they carry this proof that they are citizens of the United States. Seems straightforward. Except by the early 19th century, these same sailors are being refused and detained and otherwise held against their will in U.S. port cities when their ships come in and weigh anchor. Why? Because individual states, particularly southern states, perceive a threat in the form of black sailors. They are said to somehow carry a kind of moral contagion that might incite slave uprisings. And as a result, without having committed a crime and without being accorded any sort of due process, they are held against their will until their ships leave port. Is this constitutional? Well, it depends on whether or not you think those individuals are citizens. And attorneys general in the United States will debate this question over many decades and agree and disagree. But I share that example to suggest the kind of dilemma very close to the ground and in their lived experiences that Black Americans begin to confront because the Constitution is not clear or doesn't speak with a full voice about their status because lawmakers, the difference between port officials in Charleston and a customs official in New York, mean that they can face officials who themselves have differing ideas about Black citizenship and the possibility of African American citizenship. And this is really that puzzle, that dilemma, that murkiness that we recognize characterizes the high texts. And that is how it plays out in the everyday lives of former slaves. So say you're one of these black sailors you've been talking about and you're on a voyage and your ship happens to take you to Charleston, South Carolina, where you're detained. So you produce your certificate of citizenship and the Charleston authorities refuse to let you go. Do you have any recourse to challenge the fact that the Charleston authorities are ignoring your certificate and denying your citizenship rights? It's a great question. We don't have examples of people challenging that treatment in the way I think we'd think of it today, right? Which is to say you would bring a civil rights styled claim and come before a judge. We don't have those kinds of examples. So one answer might be no. And on the other hand, we have many examples of the ways in which sailors, former seamen will come back into that local courthouse and use the kinds of proceedings that are available to them to chart out, to construct, to piece together a counter argument about their national belonging. So this is why the local courthouse records that we talked about just a few moments ago are so important, because they are the place 
that is the venue in which these former sailors will begin to show us how they are set on challenging and clarifying as best they can where they stand before the Constitution. Now, we know throughout the course of American history that there were movements against slavery. There was the anti-slavery movement, the abolition movement. Was there ever a movement by free blacks to challenge the idea that they weren't citizens? Yes. And by the early 19th century, a school of thought that really has its origins in the era of the revolution that we associate with figures like Thomas Jefferson has taken institutional form. And this is a movement that we come to call colonization. So colonization, I might say, if for some scholars has been described as its own sort of anti-slavery movement, not because its first objective is to end the institution of slavery, but because colonization is a movement that anticipates the end of slavery. It might be in a matter of years or decades or even across a century. But colonizationists like Jefferson anticipate the end of the institution. And the question is, what, if any, will be the role of former slaves in a post-slavery society? And the answer, in short, from the colonizationist view, is that there is no place for former slaves in the nation going forward, that the U.S. must, will, should be a white person's republic. And as a consequence, colonizationists begin to not only develop a school of thought, but by the early 19th century, they develop a political movement whose purpose it is to raise funds, to outfit ships, to establish the colony of Liberia, and to organize for the removal of former slaves from the United States. This threat of colonization is precisely what will move Black Americans to first and foremost understand the precariousness of their situation in the United States, to appreciate the significance of citizenship, which might help them to resist the threat of colonization, and to your question, leads to the emergence of what we call the Colored Convention Movement. And this is the express organization of African-American ideas, but political will aimed at resisting the force and the objectives of the colonization movement. African-Americans believe themselves to be citizens of the United States, citizens by birth, just like the president, and their political movements are going to go toward promoting, building arguments, and advocating for that view. Yeah. Could you tell us more about the colored convention movement and colonization? Because it kind of sounds like white people were giving themselves a pass. Like it was easier to ship black people from American shores and to really answer this question of who gets to be a citizen. I think that's right. Or they are answering the question in the sense that they underneath colonization is the assumption that black Americans, whatever the citizenship regime or rules might be in the U.S., and it might be murky, colonizationists are of the view that no black person can be a citizen of the United States. Hence, they are not entitled to due process. They need not be charged with a crime in order to be detained and exiled from the country. You're right, though, that to understand the Colored Convention movement, to discern it, is to appreciate the ways in which Black Americans have been, by and large, frustrated in their political aspirations, the important degree to which they have been curtailed or discouraged from the halls of officialdom, even in northern states where slavery is being or has been abolished, there is not a wholesale incorporation into the new nation. And in fact, as we move into the 19th century, we will watch as African-American men in places like New York and Pennsylvania 
and Maryland, where birthright citizens is set, in those places, African-American men will lose the vote, will be losing the rights that they associate with citizenship over time. And so the convention movement is, in a sense, evidence of the degree to which they increasingly are feeling themselves pressed to the margins of the nation. Now, in Birthright Citizens, Martha notes that the 1820s were a turning point in the debate over whether free blacks could be citizens or not. So, Martha, was this turning point the colonization movement or was it something else? It is colonization. The American Colonization Society is organized right at the end of the 18-teens. So here we have one reason for the emergence of a sort of turning point, a kind of pressure that is emerging on Black Americans out of colonization. At the same time, we have the debut of the era we often characterize as one of Jacksonian democracy, the expansion of the vote beyond propertied elite white men to white men more generally, to working class men. As a consequence, for example, in a state like New York, as New York expands the possibility right, for voting to many more white men, there is a question about whether that moment should also open the door more widely to African-American men. So you have a debate there that is associated with the Jacksonian era. We have the admission of new states like Missouri into the Union. And the question then is, to what degree must, can, should Missouri acknowledge, countenance, endorse the citizenship rights of former slaves as Missouri is drafting its constitution? Can Missouri, for example, bar African-Americans from entering the state? Well, it depends on whether or not you think they're citizens of the United States. And then we have the example of the denmark Vesey conspiracy in South Carolina, the fear, the, even the paranoia in slaveholding states of the degree to which former slaves, free African-Americans might be responsible for and deliberately inciting enslaved people to rise up. All of these pressures sort of crystallize at the end of the 18-teens and the early 1820s. And as a consequence, indeed, the pressures on former slaves to consider, if you will, self-deporting by migrating to Canada or to the Caribbean um, or to Liberia in West Africa, those pressures are really increasing. I'm curious about those pressures, but before we discuss them, we've talked about New York and we've talked about Maryland and Missouri and South Carolina. And when we think about issues of freedom and slavery, we're trained to think along sectional lines. We're taught to think that in the North, African-Americans could be free and in the South, they generally could not be free. And I wonder if the question of citizenship fell along these same sectional lines. So were African-Americans in northern states considered and treated more like citizens than those who lived in southern states? It did not. And that's a great question that while we can see in the state of Maryland, a slaveholding state with a large community of former slaves, we can see these questions sort of vividly enacted in the same moments. African-American men in New York in 1821, even as they are coming to be free people, many of them are free, even as they are acknowledged to be citizens of the state of New York, they are being subjected to a property qualification in New York that white men are being excused from in 1821 when the state constitution is amended. In the state of Pennsylvania, another state where slavery has been abolished, where African Americans, former slaves, free people of color are acknowledged as citizens of the state of Pennsylvania, in 1838, African American men will lose the right to vote in the state of Pennsylvania. So it's a reminder to us that the question of slavery and freedom is one way in which we might think about and characterize the geography of the nation. But this question about freedom and citizenship is another. And in this sense, I think the story is much more a national story 
that even in those places where freedom is now the order of the day, citizenship, certainly full citizenship that comes to include political rights, is on the horizon rather than a fact. Now, to return to the issue of forced immigration, could you tell us a bit more about how this idea began to heat up and take hold and why it was even an idea in the first place? Because I really got the sense from your book, Birthright Citizens, that many free African-Americans in the early to mid-19th century really thought the United States was going to deport them. And yet they were born in the United States. So where did this idea of forced immigration come from? Colonization is a difficult movement, I think, for us to wrap our minds around in the 21st century. Was it really possible for the early United States to imagine physically relocating, deporting tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people? Well, one of the things that former slaves study carefully and with great concern is the Indian removal of the 1830s. And this fuels their sense that the nation is, in fact, very capable, not simply of legislating, but then facilitating and forcing the relocation of tens of thousands of people, many, many of them against their will under very brutal circumstances. So former slaves are students of the nation and what the nation is capable of. And Indian removal is an important example. They are students of what's happening in state legislatures. And in my example of Maryland, by 1821, a local lawmaker by the name of Octavius Tawney, yes, a brother to the figure who will emerge as the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, Roger Brooke Tawney, will, as early as 1821, proposed legislation in Maryland that would have provided for not the gentle persuasion or gentle coercion that we associate with the colonization movement, but the forced removal of former slaves from the state of Maryland. Octavius Tawney does not succeed in 1821, but he's not the last state lawmaker in the American South to propose legislation that would have required the forced removal of former slaves. That remains a live question all the way through to the Civil War. So there are many reasons for former slaves to take the threat of colonization seriously in an external sense. And then when we look back at the deliberations in Black newspapers or African-American conventions, what we discover is what I would characterize as a kind of lamentful thinking, which is to say former slaves are by and large convinced of their own arguments, which is to say they are convinced that they are citizens of the United States. And yet increasingly over time, they are doubtful that the nation will acknowledge that, that the nation will come around to their point of view. And so they themselves will debate colonization what they call emigration, which is the voluntary Black-led movements to places like Canada West and the Caribbean. Former slaves themselves will initiate thinking and their own movements around leaving the United States because they are increasingly doubtful that the nation will, if you will, own the kinds of insights that they have long been making available. They are discouraged. Were there any cases you found of African-Americans who said, well, regardless of what happens with this move to deport us, we are going to stay in the United States. We were born here and we're going to resist whatever comes of this strain of forced migration. Did you happen to find anything in the records that expressed this sentiment? Yes. And if I could, I'd love to introduce a character from Birthright Citizens, one of my favorite characters, George Hackett. Hackett is a young man born in 1807 in Baltimore. He's born free, just in the period when African-American men have just lost the right to vote, even in the state of Maryland. His father, Charles, had been eligible to vote in the state of Maryland. So Hackett will wrestle with these questions in his own life. He will go to sea and then 
will do what for me is a remarkable thing, which is after having spent nearly two years in the Navy, having landed back in the U.S. in Nantucket, where he kind of happens into a hotbed of radical anti-slavery activism that characterizes Nantucket in the early 1840s, Hackett will come back to Baltimore and make it his life's work to press in the local courthouse, in the state house in Annapolis, and ultimately even before members of Congress, Hackett will make it his life's work to advocate for this view that he and others like him are birthright citizens with equal standing to that of white Americans before the Constitution. He's a remarkable figure if we contrast him to another admirable figure in this period, a peer, in fact, and that would be Frederick Douglass. Douglass, we know, passes through Baltimore as an enslaved man and then as a fugitive will escape to New England and later to New York before his freedom is ultimately purchased for him by fellow abolitionists. Douglas won't return to Maryland or to Baltimore in these very troubled years. He will wage his struggle valiantly from the North. But I, in this work, became deeply intrigued by figures like George Hackett, who could have left Maryland and Baltimore, stayed in Nantucket or New England, joined the community that Douglas helped to build in those places. Hackett comes home to his family, to his community, to his church community. And I'm very happy in this book to have been able to recover some of the story of not only how he stays, but why he stays and what he does with his time in Baltimore. So, Martha, I guess I have two questions for you. First, what's the end of the story of birthright citizenship? When did the United States begin to explicitly include African-Americans in its definition of citizenship? And secondly, has any part of this early American history we've been discussing left any imprint or had any impact on how we define American citizenship today? I think one answer to your question is that I'm not sure we're done. Right? Here we are in 2019 and we can open the pages of our newspapers or turn on our televisions and we know that the terms and the meaning of birthright citizenship, its applicability is still up for debate today. But I think what you might be alluding to is the era of the Civil War and Reconstruction to the ratification of the 14th Amendment in 1868 when this principle of birthright citizenship that Black Americans had recognized as there in the Constitution of 1787, who recognized that it is a principle that is carried over from English common law, now see those ideas constitutionalized unequivocally in their lives, which is to say the 14th Amendment and its first section and the first clause will deem all persons born in the United States to be citizens of the United States. And this is the realization of the position that Black Americans had long, long been advocating for. Now it is seemingly irrefutable, though I have to say seemingly, because it won't be the last time that the question of birthright citizenship will consume the nation, will consume lawmakers and be the subject of debate. Let's move into the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. opinion, Martha, what might have happened if the framers of the United States Constitution had clearly defined citizenship in 1787? How would the history of the American definition of citizenship and Black Americans' struggle to obtain recognition as citizens be different? 
I hope it's okay to say it depends. <laughs> That's a good historian's answer. On the one hand, the Constitution might have been more express about birthright as being the basis for citizenship. I would say if that was as far as the Constitution went, it seems very likely that still there would have been an open question and a genuine debate about the degree to which race or racism was a qualifier with respect to birthright. On the other hand, if the framers had gone so far as to say all persons born in the United States or citizens of the United States, regardless of race or color or previous condition of servitude, that's the language of the Civil Rights Act of 1866. If the framers had gone this far, well, wouldn't that set a very different set of terms for then the questions about race and rights that would inevitably challenge the nation going forward? Citizenship as an abstract term carries with it no particular set of rights. But what we know is that Black Americans have long used that language, that possibility to expand our sense of fundamental rights in the United States, not only for themselves, but for all Americans. Imagine what the nation might have looked like if the Constitution had drawn a clear, unequivocal prohibition against race and racism before the law. That is a whole other podcast, <laughs> but it is a really important and provocative way of appreciating the stakes in these early debates. So, Martha, what aspect of history are you researching and writing about now? Uh, thank you for asking. I'm finishing a book this year called Vanguard, which is a political history of African-American women and the vote. It spans from 1820 to 2020, and I hope will be a really useful companion for our thinking about the upcoming centennial of the 19th Amendment in 2020 and the place of African-American women in our body politic. And how can we get in contact with you if we have more questions about birthright citizenship or African-Americans work to help define citizenship? The best way is my website, which is MarthaSJones.com. And there you can find links to the book, but also to articles and essays, podcasts like Ben Franklin's World, where I think your listeners will find my thinking about the question of birthright citizenship, not only in the past, but the stakes of this question and the insights of this past for the present. Martha S. Jones, Thank you for joining us and for helping us explore early American ideas about citizenship and the many ways Black Americans work to help define and expand that definition of citizenship. Thanks for having me. The idea of birthright citizenship is that a person's membership or belonging to a country or nation is determined at birth by their place of birth. It's an idea with ancient roots and one that came to the United States through its colonial experiences with English common law. Now, as Martha revealed, Understanding how different nations define and view citizenship is really important because citizenship comes with membership rights, protections a country or nation bestows upon those who belong to it. And from our conversation, we can take away the fact that there are at least two key points for understanding how early Americans viewed citizenship. The first key is that early Americans never deeply considered how they defined citizenship. Early Americans never set down rules or definitions of who could be a citizen of the United States. They didn't put any guidelines in the Constitution. Instead, in the earliest days of the early Republic, citizenship in the United States emerged out of a set of assumptions about who belongs and who could belong. And as Martha told us, this is in part why the question of citizenship can get really murky. The framers and founders of the nation didn't leave any instructions for how to define a citizen. They didn't tell us in any official way what rules or guidelines we should use to determine who can and who can't belong to the United States. Now, the second key for understanding how early Americans viewed citizenship is that many of their ideas about citizenship were defined by notions of race, racial identity, and racism. 
And this is in part what makes Martha's study of birthright citizenship in the years before and just after the Civil War so fascinating. By the basic rules and definitions of birthright citizenship, free African Americans should have been full citizens of the early United States because they were born within the United States. And yet, as Martha described for us, many early white Americans didn't think that free black Americans should be full citizens or even partial citizens of the United States. So how did early Americans deal with this quandary? How did they wrestle with and reconcile the fact that they held different ideas about citizenship? These are questions that sent Martha into the courthouse records to find answers. And in those records, she found free African-Americans like George Hackett who asserted and challenged ideas about their belonging to the United States. And then from the courthouse records, Martha then went and looked at other types of historical records, like newspapers, state and local government records, and the diaries and journals of African Americans and white lawmakers. From these records, Martha was able to tease out answers to larger questions about citizenship. And what she found is what she shared with us. Citizenship is a negotiated process. For early Americans, the process of negotiation culminated in 1868 with the ratification of the Constitution's 14th Amendment, which is the first section of the Constitution to explicitly define who can be a citizen. But for us, Americans living in the 21st century, the process of negotiation is ongoing. Even though we have the 14th Amendment and its definition of who can be a citizen, as Martha related, citizenship and the notion of birthright citizenship are still ideas that we're negotiating today. Look for more information about Martha, her book, Birthright Citizens, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 255. Don't forget to join the Ben Franklin's World listener community on Facebook and join the discussion. The listener community is a private Facebook group, but joining the community is really easy. Just visit benfranklinsworld.com and click on the join the community button right on the homepage. If you enjoyed today's conversation, I hope you'll tell a friend about it. I also hope you'll stay tuned because in October, the Omohundro Institute and I will be releasing the new Doing History series, which will focus on the history of law in the United States and how historians, legal scholars, lawyers, and judges study and make use of legal history and the practice of law. It should be a really interesting series, and we're going to investigate this history by exploring the history of the Bill of Rights and the Fourth Amendment. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital projects team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Kayla Pittman, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, what do you think about citizenship and how much do you think we should rely on history to help us define citizenship? As Martha noted, this is a concept that we're still negotiating and trying to hash out today. So how do you think we should define who should or shouldn't be a citizen? And how much do you think we should rely on history to help us answer that question? I'm really curious what you think. So email me, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute.